I have had to confront so much of my own bias that I did not know was there. I'm locking a door when a black man walks by. I just don't want to talk about it. That's not how I am. And so I find myself very frustrated if I try to draw certain relatives of ours into conversations about our past or what they know. There's always more to the story. And that's how I feel about everything. There's Hi, I'm Danielle Romero. Thank you so much for being with me here on my channel where I've been talking about family history, American identity. And today I'm going to interview my cousin, Alicia. She actually talked with me a year ago for the original Finding Lola series. And I'm so excited to bring her on. She's my mom's niece. So uh, her mom and my mom are sisters. And her mom is Nancy, who also talked with me. And I'm really just looking to get her reaction to everything that came out during the series. And kind of just see where she's at with it. So I think she's waiting for us right now. So let's go over and see her. My name is Alicia Purdy. I'm a writer. I'm a journalist. I'm an author. I'm a mom. I'm a homeschool mom. But before all of the rest, I am a child of God. And you're my cousin. <laughs> and I'm the cousin of Danielle Romero. <laughs> yeah, so and our moms are sisters. And uh, Marion is our shared grandmother. Our beautiful, wonderful yes, grandmother. Yes, absolutely. Grandmother. She's so, the reason I wouldn't show up to anything I'm doing on camera without a little bit of makeup and at least some jewelry. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I started getting like two gray hairs and I was like, Grammy would tell me to die. Yet. So I don't know. A hundred percent. We talked individually like a year-ish ago, year and a half ago, maybe even. Um, and I went down to Louisiana twice and all that. That was amazing. Let's talk about uh, like where are you at with everything? Like, I know we started to talk, you shared a lot. Um, what do you think about the family now? And what questions do you still have? Oh, I have all the questions and not very many answers. I could go all day with questions. I, that's the journalist in me. I, I could go all day and never have enough answers. And I have definitely reconciled that some answers are just not going to come because yeah. people don't want to talk. And I try not to get too judgy about that. Like I'm trying to like walk a mile in their shoes type of thing. And, and what, what must it be like to walk through some of these really difficult and uncomfortable truths that were able to be buried for generations and hundreds of years and thousands of years. You can just bury who your father was. You can just bury this, this uncomfortable truth, or you could bury the abuse or, you know, you can just bury things and not talk about it. But I have questions and, and, our generation, I'm generation X. And so I was born in 1977. So somewhere around there going forward, people are so much more comfortable with uncomfortable truth. And so I would like to know, I would like to hear that. I love human stories. I love messy. I love, I see it all in light of God's redemption. Um, but I know I'm relatively unique there in that some people just don't want to talk about it. That's not how I am. And so I find myself very frustrated if I try to draw certain relatives of ours into conversations about our past or what they know. It's uncomfortable. It's a half, you know, it's a kind of like a half-hearted story type of thing. But I think, I think all of it just creates a beautiful framework to know someone that you love that much better. Mm -hmm. But anyway, I, I feel relatively alone in desiring that. And so the conversations are few and far between. They are scant on information. And if I do ask more questions, because I always have another question, if I do ask more questions, it pretty soon gets shut down. And I will say it actually, for me personally, goes for both sides of my family. Mm. My dad's side is the same way. There are no mm. talkers about the past. And my mom's side is pretty similar where generations of, as they've gotten older are more hesitant to talk about the past. And I think, mm. I think it's because it feels disparaging to someone who's dead that you loved, who can't speak for themselves and maybe clarify. I've noticed a protectiveness when I do dig and ask some questions. And I'm just asking genuine questions. I have no, no nefarious means here. I'm, I'm a relative of the people that we love. And so right. I, I'm not trying to do anything bad with the information. I just want to learn more about myself and our family and our world. But I sense almost like a like a circling of the wagons or I just cannot break through in my own family where they're like, well, she didn't mean that, or she didn't know that, or I'm, yeah. I'm not attacking anybody. Why are you being defensive? That's kind of where it goes with it. And, um, and it makes me a little sad. I wish I could know more. 
I don't know. I feel like we're very similar because I'm not a journalist, um, but I'm still going to bother people. <laughs> like, I'm, you're I don't a know. natural digger. Oh, you know, you're a natural know. digger. No credentials for it. Just, I think though, there are people in the family, um, I, I, you and me, I'm sure there's a couple others who I think are pretty open, but I think it is a generational thing. Um, I think one of the things that I, if I could sit down and ask, well, let me ask you first. So our, our grandmother, um, you know, we grew up with and we knew her very really well. If you could ask her one question in light of all of this, what would you ask her? And then I want to tell you what I've been kind of working through. My if thing. I thought I could get a genuine answer. Yeah. And that's she would respond. Right there. Yeah. <laughs> if I thought I'd get a genuine answer, uh, because Grammy comes from a family that had to conceal so much that it just became part of the way you do. But if I thought I could ge get a genuine answer, what I would really want to know is what would she consider to be the greatest heartbreak of her life, her greatest struggle, and her greatest triumph? That's what I would want to know. I'd want to know her heart. Yeah. I feel like that's something I've saw her behavior. I yeah. I've heard the stories. But in terms of knowing her heart, I don't think that generation is very forthcoming with that anyway, but I would love to know her as a deeper human being. That is the journalist in me because I'm an, I have a natural proclivity and attraction to storytelling and transformational journeys. And we all have them, even if they're not great stories, they're all right. points of transformation in our lives. And I find that to be a profound interest. And I would love to know deeper more I would love to glimpse more deeply into her heart and hear her reflections on on those things I wonder um my brother and I were talking about my our mom and how our mom uh has picked up uh, nurture and nature I don't know I think it's yeah. gen honestly it may be genetic I don't know but that she really has no recollection of life before meeting my dad and my brother was just like what oh. like what about your childhood and she's just like yeah <laughs> yeah and uh, I think there is this sense of living in the moment, enjoying the moment, being grateful for the moment, but I think to the detriment of passing information down to people. And I think yeah. there's a of that, like we just don't have it. Um, so some stuff, uh, I, I don't know how much I shared in the actual series or how much it's just been like coming out as I've been working. But one of the things was uh, Grammy's DNA test compared to like her brothers. And you have to kind of take the sum of all the parts because these right. tests are kind of trash. It's not any one thing. Right. And it's like, they're not being divided up equal. It, yeah. So you're, you have to kind of look at the body of evidence, but right. the body of evidence points to Grammy and her brothers being almost a quarter African-American, which to me is astounding for a family that is a hundred percent French. Like, you yeah, know, the, the math right. is fantastical like yeah to me um you know that line of like who's considered black I'm understanding I'm learning it's so much more of a community cultural experience mm, than right like, percentage that's um, that it is genetics correct and so many people I can't even tell you hundreds maybe thousands of people who identify as being a part of the black community let's say like your grandmother looks like my my auntie or she's she's uh, she's um darker than my mom and we're black and all this stuff and it, it has kind of like reframed this understanding of what if grammy had been raised by a half half black mom let's just say like lola was about half half african-american to see herself that way and it's like that would mean that our moms would be saying well they have a, a black grandmother their grandma's black it's fine she right could be whatever she could be irish she could be polish she could be whatever but and it's like that to me is just so shocking that um, I, it's hard to even articulate because I don't feel like I belong in the community. We weren't raised in that community. That's not something that we right. have these times. And to. you cannot elbow your way into it either and with like, your yeah, DNA yeah. test. It's right. not accepted. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. About, yeah, no elbowing in, but just taking the step back and saying like, whoa, like that mm -hmm. was an about face. Like that's a 180 yeah. here. Um, well, a huge part of the identity I feel I have as a human being mm. through the Nolan side of the family mm. is Irish. I thought I was Irish. I thought I was like a hundred percent Irish my whole life because on my other side of the family, yeah. my other grandmother was Irish mm. and my other grandfather was German. Turns out he was Jewish, not oh German. He was a German Jew. He wasn't just 
wow. randomly German. He was a German Jew Wait, specifically. Is that, your, is that your dad's mom? My dad's or dad. Dad's dad? Yes. And my dad's mom, her last name, her maiden name was Grogan. So they were pretty Irish, but my identity, my mom would used to tell me all my life, I was a little Irish lass and I had this red hair and I was all covered in freckles and I'm singing, growing up singing Danny boy. I, I thought I was Irish. I had no idea. Which we, <laughs> so, we are. We are. I think it's just a sense of like, it's this all or nothingness. And I think, well, this is our community. Are, we are right. in the Irish community. That's how I was raised in the Irish community. I'm like the Hiberian Hall. I'm marching in a parade. I've got a shamrock. I, I think I'm Irish. Mm. That's how I was raised. That's that was my community. Was that I was Irish and not for nothing, but I was also raised as you know my identity being an Irish lass. To know that I was an original slave of the English. That I was you know I was the original ape man. That the Irish you know, looking at the pictures of Darwin's like sloped yeah. forehead and the Irish. prominent nose and the Irish. shrewd eyes and all these things that you know evolution teaches us. At the end of the day, though, I am a hundred percent, a hundred percent convinced. I'm unpersuadable, and and I have genetics, science, history, and the Bible on my side that we are simply all part of the human family, and it has nothing to do with anything other than people have always had slaves, people have always intermarried, people have always had secret babies. This is we are all so blended genetically right. throughout the dispersion of humanity over time mm. that. Like you said, this is simply a matter of community and culture at this point. You can look at your DNA tests and like you said, saw siblings can can manifest as something other than their other sibling just because of the way it shakes out. We're all part of the human family as far as I'm concerned. And it becomes a matter of tribe and nation and tongue and creed and that kind of thing that really divides people. Because I have a friend from Russia who looks Asian and she yeah. is Russian through and through. Yeah. She was raised in Russia. She was born in Russia but they have Asian sort of Asian eyes. And she was telling me about the trajectory of her family that they did come from Asia and they went up and over generations of time, this is just how genetics manifested in her. And so people sometimes mistake her, but she's Russian hundred yeah. percent. And so uh, yeah, like I, I'm a human family type of person. I'm like, we're all brothers and sisters. I agree. And I think maybe that's why I think this has resonated with so many people because it's not unique to our family, not even mm -hmm. just having a story of like passing, so to speak, but just the sense that if you're right. honest and you look back two generations, maybe three as an American, you're going to find a lot. You're going to find a lot sure. of, oh, of yeah. braids that are, you know, being woven together and uh, I think it kind of just, it's the big lie. I think I honestly talk about the media with this all the time of, of framing things and, you know, white yeah. on black violence. A divisive black agenda. Violence. So I'm like, well, who are you yeah. talking about? Like, yeah. who are you Well, that's because about? there's wealth in war. And at any point in time when you need people to just bicker and not get along so that they'll go yeah. buy your new tank and gun, well, then you can just tell you you're black and you're white and now we're fighting. Yeah. And it's amazing. So I'm like, I feel not, not that I feel like now I'm black or now I'm not white or this or that, but I think no, you I'm ain't like, black. Joe Biden told you that. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like, I realize I don't have to subscribe to this. And right. I think just saying there's a lot of people that don't want to subscribe to this. And I think, I think I really feel more optimistic about our country just from reading. Honestly, it sounds ridiculous, but reading people's responses to so much of like, we're just tired of this and mm -hmm. like how beautiful it is. If we can look back a little bit in our family story and just start learning our family story. And it's like, it almost always has to create empathy for yeah. your neighbor because you realize, oh, like we were related two generations back three. I don't know. It, it's been really interesting. What has been, um, what do you feel like was the most surprising thing that you found or saw, I guess, during this whole journey of us digging into our great, our great. Well, we're blacker story. than we thought we were. And that was a surprise to me. We're more colored, I should say, because we're not just black or just right. other things too, Native yeah. American, et cetera. Um, that was surprising that we were more colored than I thought we were. Like I said, I really was raised with the Irish last narrative. I am not kidding you. I, all the flags, the hats, Notre Dame, the whole thing. Like I was raised, grandpa For was sure. like, you're Irish, 100%. For sure. Um, and so not that I'm white, that I'm Irish. I can't help that my skin is white, but I was raised to like culturally identify in some kind of way with an mm -hmm. Irish background. And he was proud of that because his parents came, you know, off the boat. So he, right. I feel like he really pushed that narrative. I have no, no quarrel with that. But I was very surprised to find an interesting irony 
that if grandpa and his family had known how dark Grammy really was. I know they were already against that relationship because of her education status right. and because she was such a scrappy street urchin and he was a man of standing in college and medicine and uh, not medicine, a uh, college degree in military right. um, to realize that whatever, whatever forces brought them together to create the children that they did um, and have this, this weird up and down marriage that, right actually did last just on paper and um to have all that happen i know that his fa- his mother ella ryan did not want grammy to did not want him to marry grammy mm. i don't but think i had she yes she did not she did not approve because grammy was not educated and intelligent she was just a young pretty thing mm. at, at the time and so it, there was a disapproval there from ellen and john ryan and if they had known how black she was, how colored she was, how Native American she was. I think they would have put up a much bigger fight about grandpa having children with her Mm. and and marrying her at all because they were, they saw themselves a certain way the Nolan family did Mm. as people of standing and prominence. Mm. And, you know, grandpa went to college. It was a huge deal in his day. And so they... Had they known the truth, now as I've learned the truth, and I'm like, wow, it's quite, quite shocking and layered. Yeah. Um, I think that it may have come out differently had genetics been available back then, or they'd run some kind of test on Grammy to see, oh, she was some tribe, she was yeah. a tribal person, she practically might as well be barefoot, you know, go back to Africa. Like they would have gone right down to the dirt and been like, no. Mm-hmm. She's, she's gone. That's what I really think if I were to speculate. So that to me was very surprising to realize. Mm. I don't think any of this would have happened had this knowledge been available Mm. all these years ago. It's not, it's amazing. Um, I I think about how my dad knew Lola. So our great grandmother, he knew her not like really well. He was dating my mom. Um, and he said he met her a bunch of times and like, I tried to press him. I squeezed him on stuff because yeah, he's not, he's not blood on there. He could tell all the, the stories. Yeah. Oh, you can dish it dad. Just tell me off record. Uh, yeah. Um, but he had, he had, uh, it is one of those interesting things where I think you believe a lot that you're told about someone. Cause you think, why should I question what someone has to say? You believe it. And you don't know for yourself. So you just, all you can do is listen. It's, it's believe it. But then later on, when you have more information, you're like, okay. And you know, you start putting this stuff together. Cause I remember he told me she had a really heavy accent and, and she was, he was like, mm. she's pretty dark, but I thought maybe she was Mediterranean. I mean, you see my dad, he's dark, but he's Italian. He's like, it kind of, it kind of worked. But, um, but it, The more I talked to like uncle Danny was such a wealth of information. Like he did not care. He's like, I will tell you everything. I'm like some of the stuff like Danny, we can't share all of that. That's me. I'm the, like, I talk too much. I will say it. And then I will retract if I feel like it. He's like, he's just like, here it all is. And he was a little boy. And so some of these things really, I mean, you think he's a man in his eighties. He still remembers how he felt as a child. Um, hearing his, his grandpa kick his mom out of the house and, and things like that. I wanted to talk about um, that story. I don't think we got to sit and talk about it no. together. Um, so their, their dad died, Lola's husband died, eight kids. So our Grammy's alive, you know, because Uncle Danny was the youngest. He was like six at this point. So maybe she was like seven or eight or something. So like old enough. Um, and he said that Lola was trying to get money to bury him john donnelly um and she got kicked out and they were like you know he's like take the, take those indian kids out of here like basically we're just no no thank you like y'all you know, the 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 tie has been severed um now that your husband's dead I, I i have put myself into that position so many times just thinking about how desperate it must feel and what an incredible woman she was yeah. so tell me about so we're new yorkers tell me about what it's like to be connected to Louisiana for you. Louisiana, in my mind, is just filled with swamps and hillbillies. And I visit, I mean, I've been to Louisiana. It's beautiful. I've been to New Orleans. I've driven over the bayou. I, I've done all that. It's very beautiful. But I'm saying in terms of family bias, um, I remember Aunt Maggie saying she had gone down there um, to do something with genealogies or figure something out. And my mother, so this is like third-hand information, but my mom telling me, 
how shocked Aunt Maggie was by the family in Louisiana and said they were all like hillbillies, heavy accent, barely understood, like living in tar paper houses. That's the way that she made it sound. And so my bias wasn't ever against Louisiana as a, a state or a people, but definitely in terms of having some kind of relatives there, I'm I'm a true northerner. I'm like, let's get John out of the South. Okay, it's filled with racists and slave owners. Let's let's bring John up here, yeah. and uh, you're gonna have a much better life. That's how I've always. I actually still feel that way. I um, I do see that that has that was definitely a bias I had against our Louisiana family. But again, it was through Aunt Maggie, like to my mother, maybe even through Grammy. I don't know. There was, it was some kind of layered information by the time it got to me. And it was like, thank God she got out of there. They're all a bunch of backwater, uneducated, dirt house type of people. And we here in the North, you know, we've got marble balls. And so that's how I've just always seen it and thought about it. And when, you, when you've been digging and seeing Louisiana and really humanizing this this disembodied type of history that's floated in the back of my mind all of my life it's been very fascinating to see that human side and to realize whatever aunt maggie saw i don't know i don't know who she saw i don't know who she met i don't know how far she got in that process or what was what was a hillbilly to her maybe it was just an accent Mm, Um, i distinctly remember things like dirt floors and tar paper and i would have to go back and verify that with my own mom um, that Aunt Maggie reported back when she visited these relatives. Wow. I, I don't have any more information than that because I never followed up on it. But that's definitely something I carried. And my thing was like, thank God she got out of there mm-hmm. because the North is uh, such a better place to live. I still think that way. But then I feel like the North is the place to be when, you, when you're when you looking for resources. Uh, we have our own problems up here. But when you're looking into it, we're a nanny state. But in terms of resources, mm-hmm people, a single women, I was a single mom for eight years in the state of New York. And so when it comes to things like putting food on the table, I don't need to be a prostitute. I'll just go get some food stamps. And there is a lot of infrastructure here to be poor and hard on your luck, down on your luck. Mm -hmm. And so um, that would have been probably a different world for her. I would assume than what I, the picture I have in my mind of what the South would have been, the deep South would have been like for her as a woman back then with eight mouths, eight mouths to feed now is a lot. That's crazy. I can't even imagine in the world that she lived in. And this is why women do things like crime or whatever it is they yeah. do. There's always, that's the journalist in me. There's always more to the story. And that's how I feel about everything. There's always more to the story you don't realize that in everyone's personal story, they're the hero. They're justified in the decisions they made. They know the extenuating circumstances of why they had to do this thing. But Mm -hmm. to the person that's walking that journey, there's an extenuating circumstance why they did it. And in their mind, they are justified for having done so. Mm -hmm. And so I like to look at the more to the story. I, there's always more. And so, um, when I see all the, the Louisiana and the decisions that she had to make and she remarries and she's out on the street, all of that, there is always more to that. There's more to her father's story who kicked her out. Mm-hmm. There's his own bias where he came from. There's his own strongholds, his own experiences in life. Uh, maybe he was disappointed or humiliated, or he had been raised a certain way. Like just always more. And there's, there's always more and there's never enough. That's how I see it. Yeah. There is always more to the story. And I think, I think, I think we know that intuitively yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and it has helped me to be a lot more empathetic to people. Yes, absolutely. Because as I'm doing this, there's like these concentric circles where I've been so, I was so focused on like our grandmother. And then it's like, it's, as I'm doing it, it's growing. And, mm-hmm. and I researched a little bit about like the Irish American experience and just how hard yes. it was for them to get here. I'm like, that was only a, a, a generation before all this stuff happened for our grandmother and Lola and how the Irish are treated. And they were probably feeling on precarious ground. Like they've barely, Very much so. you know, been accepted into American society. How could you have your son now marry some mixed girl from Louisiana and undo yeah. all the hard work that you did to try to get your family accepted? And it's like the stepping on the neck. Um, yeah. Thing, but- but I also understand it, you know, it's like oh, that's, I, that's human tendency. Absolutely. It is. And so I, 
I don't know. I don't, I'm sure you feel similarly, but I really mourn the like racial division in our country and like what our kids are inheriting. It, it yeah. really makes me sad. And I really hope that, I don't know, maybe, maybe just seeing, seeing how everything is touching can help people to not. Maybe, maybe life. these kind of projects just, you know what, it's no different than it is in doing work for the kingdom. If you reach one person, it's worth it. If you change one life and that life can turn and they are really transformed in the way they think or the things they do or whatever that is, they would naturally turn because of the transformation compels them. They would naturally turn and and bring that into existence in another person's life, Ex inspire, ignite, whatever, how it, however the world, this is how the world changes because um, it, it, the principle can be applied to anything. It can be applied to wealth management. It can be applied to raising a child and breaking a chain of abuse. And it can be applied to spiritual things in the kingdom of God. You really just need one person who gets it and is willing to convey that and can articulate that out into the, the space. And then another person who catches passion and vision for that as well. And then they can turn in their way and articulate it. Mm. And changing large masses of people is like, like hoping someone's going to get saved at a crusade. Like the statistics are there to show it's very rare mm -hmm. that people that do that, it's usually shallow and they don't, they don't continue on. But that like that friendship evangelism principle, it's the same principle here that when you have the friendship evangelism of the message that you're putting out there and people relate to you and they feel your story and it resonates with them, that's what changes people more than becoming some kind of YouTube influencer that people just gawk at and scroll by or whatever. When you have a connection with people, that's what draws people in. All people, you could tell, you could tell a long, boring story in perfect English, or a compelling and transformative story in broken English, and you'd reach more people with the passion of your story. They'll, they'll forget the weeds. They'll, they'll, mm -hmm. they'll be drawn in by what you're saying, and so, and by the conviction with which you speak. And so, I see it the same way. You're talking about, you know, colorism, et cetera. I have had to confront so much of my own bias that I did not know was there. And I don't want to sound like a woke white person because I, I'm not woke, not in any way, shape or form. But I think as a believer who really does believe that we are all one people, just of different tribes and nations yeah. and tongues, but still one blood. Yeah. Um, I really feel like I have a responsibility. This is just me as a person. I don't see this reflected in a lot of other places in my family or in my circles. Yeah. I, but I really do believe I have a responsibility if I have that revelation mm -hmm. to act upon it. Yeah. And one of those things is noticing bias that I have. And so I've had to be very careful. I don't like walk around telling black jokes or anything. And I never did. Never did. I don't, I've never mm -hmm. even tolerated black jokes. I'm the person that's like, I don't think that's funny. And I don't appreciate you talking like that in front of my children. Thank you. Yeah. I'll say it. I will I ruin will. dinner. I I'm, I'm the person. I, I will ruin will. your holiday. You tell a black joke. And so uh, that's just how I am. I've always been that way, but I have noticed as the world does become a little more awakened, not woke, but awakened to these things. I have noticed things that I didn't know were in me and I did not put in myself mm -hmm. that I have had to weed out. Like, um, I don't know, locking a door when a black man walks by. Mm -hmm. um, that was something I was not specifically taught to lock when black people mm -hmm. walk by. I was definitely taught to lock my doors when a man walk, walks by for sure. Like right. man, weirdo, I don't care what your gender is, lock, yeah. goodbye. Gather to create a bias because now I have a different message over here though of, that I've heard you know, maybe all my life or in conversation or even in a stinking television commercial where there's a passive anti-blackness of some kind. It's only white people in the commercial. It's only, whatever that is. And it all comes together mm -hmm. and it becomes an action that I take in a different moment of time where the root is your other you are an other and I'm going to lock my door. I don't want that. Now I will lock my door because you are a weirdo freak who is talking to yourself lock, but it should have nothing to do with skin color. And now it doesn't in my life, but it's one of those things you see in your own head about yourself. And you think like, why did I do that? I'm always looking into that kind of stuff because I'm not trying to be a woke person. I want to be the best version of myself I can be. And I want to honor the Lord of my life. I literally don't care what other people think about me or what my motive, what they misrepresent my motivations are. I know that for me as a person, it would reflect God's character for me to mm -hmm. continually strive to see people with equality as God does. And I want to be like that. And so I have to confront things as they come up that I didn't know were even in me. And that's what's mm -hmm. distressing.
I didn't even know it was in me till I took action on that thing. And I'm the kind of person that's like, wait, why did I do that? I have analysis paralysis. I'm always like, why did I do that? What did that, what, what did I, what did I do there? It's so to reflect. I, I think part of it is like you said, this idea of like, not even knowing that, and we grew up in very diverse places. I feel like our church yes, is like- I traveled the world. Yep. So international diverse. church. Yes. Like I, we didn't grow up in a, in a white bubble. That's not how your parents raised you or my not parents at all. raised me. And we, we grew up pretty close. No. You know? I'm very metropolitan. Like, yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, geographically. And so we, I know that we've, we have that same experience. That's something that our parents have just, uh, it, it, that's just how we were raised. And so there is this other thing coming in because that's not coming in from my parents, you know, that's not something that, right. But I think what is just amazing mm -hmm. to me is as I'm doing the family stuff and seeing, okay, so everybody was black two generations ago. Like the, our family were the ones who would be, so to speak, walking down the street and people are trying to cross to get away. Yeah. Or I was, I was not raised yeah. by my parents to think, but I have heard culturally mm -hmm. to be careful about dating black people because they see black men, because they see a white woman as a trophy. That's something I don't even know where I got. I wasn't raised that way, but somewhere along the way, mm -hmm. I heard it somewhere and it got, it got in my head and I heard enough people say it that I thought, well, I'm, I mean, I don't care. It didn't like influence my decision for the person yeah. I married, Yeah, but it was something always in the back of my mind. And it came up in some movie or something I was watching recently and it stuck with me. And I was like, I've actually heard that before. Mm. Like I said, it didn't influence my my thinking, but I noticed it when I was, I was watching the TV you. show. What do you think Grammy would think about all of this now in hindsight? And because uh, I've kind of wondered if I did her dirty a little bit. I really do. I think about that sometimes. Yes. I feel bad. I have to tell you, that's the truth. I do. I think that she would not like it because- she went to clearly great lengths to hide and her mother did the same thing. The concealing of the age. Where did you come from? What do you look like? Who are you? Your genetics, your babies. Where did you live? I mean, all of it, your education. She, she probably would not want to, if she did, she would have told more people. We're, we're trying to piece this together because we want to know her more and we have that desire to know her more. But I definitely don't think if we went back to like 45 year old Grammy and we're like, we're from the future. And in the future, here's what we figured out about you. Like, I really think she'd be like, no, none of that's true. That's all a big fat lie. <laughs> For sure. I think she just, I think she would, I think she would a hundred percent deny, 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 which is what she did. Um, I don't think she would see it as doing dirty, but I will say if she did not have the survival instinct and shame attached to it, it would probably be very, she'd probably see her journey very differently with with mm -hmm. compassion and grace for herself. Like we see it for her. We, we, I, I have no judgment for her. None. Um, I think she has judgment for herself and that would be why she wouldn't want it, but maybe in a safe place where there was, she grew up in a generation where she was just, she had to do what she had to do, but it was such a judgy time and there was no room for a mistake. There's no room to be different. There's no room to be other. There was no room to be wild and a, in a, and vivacious. There was just no room. And it just wasn't the culture for women. So no, I don't think she would like it as Grammy as we've always known her. But if the stage were set for her to understand how loved she is and how much we desire to know her, not expose her, know her, yeah. and that we find her stories empowering and inspiring and not shameful. I think it would, I think that would help turn her, her own personal narrative into something, maybe a story of triumph and survival. That's how I see it. I think that's how it is. And I think you know, we're both moms and uh, I, uh, I think about how to talk to the kids about all of it, like who yeah. they are, where their history is, what that looks like. And it's, there's no uh, playbook for me. I don't really know. Same here. I, I don't have a playbook either. And I consider that a gift of the future, like be, living in these future generations instead of the way it was in the past. I, I have, I don't have anything either. Yeah. I'm wide open. I know. And I'm just like, I don't know what the answer is. Let's, let's talk about it. I think this is it. I think like, it's okay to seek answers and to have questions. I, As a I question agree. asker, I have been suppressed my entire life mm -hmm. through shame, through my gender, through society and culture through religion, my whole life, I have been told not to ask questions. And so I, um, I've always had those questions and my, all my journalism degree did 
was let me elbow a little further into the room. I'm like, I'm a journalist and I'm on a story and I've got questions. And so I can do that now. And now I just own it. And I do not give a rip who's uncomfortable by my questions. And I try to be like classy about it, but I was not allowed to ask questions and I always had them. And I think that that also is a place where people begin to feel shame and they put the wrong pieces together of the puzzle. And then you end up with like a different picture than it should be. And I don't want that for my kids. I want my kids to ask questions and I want to teach them to ask respectful questions, questions that are articulated well, questions that are reflective of grace, questions that are are not self-righteous, but are inquiring. I think that those things are important and that under all of that, it's, I think it's fine to ask questions and I have no intention of stopping. <laughs> I, <laughs> Me neither. I'm so glad you're on here. I don't apologize for it either.